All right, Matthew chapter number 14. Let's dig right in here, uh, starting with verse number one. The Bible reads, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. So Herod hears about Jesus Christ. He hears about all these miracles. He hears about all the stuff that's going on. And he's like, That's John the Baptist. And what, what I think is just kind of interesting about this is that um, even someone like Herod, the thought of, of resurrection isn't that big of a problem for him to be thinking about. Because he's like, that's John the Baptist. Obviously it wasn't. It's was Jesus Christ. But, but that wasn't some hard thing for him to have to even accept that someone had risen again from the dead. Now, obviously, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a believer. But... Um, you know, getting people to accept that, just, I mean, it really shouldn't be that, all that difficult to accept. But what, what other thing I, I think is interesting about this, too, is that this shows you how great of a person John the Baptist was. Because when he's hearing about the works of Jesus, in his mind, he's just thinking, this is John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist, the Bible says that among them are born women, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He truly was a great man. Now, we don't get to read a lot about the life of John the Baptist, but obviously he was doing a lot of good works, enough for at least Herod to mistake Jesus for John the Baptist himself. So that just gives another testimony unto, unto John the Baptist in that regard. Let's keep reading here. So he hears this, and he thinks it's John. And verse 3 explains a little bit more why he even knows so much about John. Verse 3, the Bible says, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, Is it not lawful for thee, excuse me, it is not lawful for thee to have her. So what happened with John the Baptist is he's preaching. He's a Baptist preacher He's a leather lung preacher. He's preaching the word of God. He's preaching the law of God. He's preaching on righteousness and truth. And he doesn't matter. He's not a respecter of persons when it comes to, you know, the governor, when it comes to Herod, when it comes to anyone. It doesn't matter who it is. God's law doesn't bend or change for anybody. And he says to Herod, hey, it's not lawful for you to marry your brother's wife. It's not lawful. Now, do you think he was talking about the Roman law at the time? No, of course not. It's not always, he's not referring to Roman law, or you, you can't marry her. He's talking about God's law. He's referring to Leviticus. Leviticus 18, uh, verse 16, to be specific. The Bible says, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Now, when it's talking about him being married to his brother's wife, they probably got divorced. I mean, we don't get that information. But God considers those people still married. That's why when, you, when someone gets divorced, they're supposed to remain unmarried until their ex-spouse dies because they're still bound by God's law. So either way, what he did was wicked and wrong, and John called him out on it. And because John called him out on it, now, it wasn't Herod that was just wanting to, you know, that, that got all upset by this and wanted to arrest him. It was Herodias. That's why the Bible says it's for Herodias' sake, which was his wife. Now, this is a, a really wicked woman. Obviously, first of all, she, she trades up on the husbands in the family, probably because Herod was, you know, a little bit better of a, of a man because he's higher up on the food chain when it comes to being in a position of authority. I mean, who knows what Herod's brother was like, but she's probably thinking, oh, here's a man of, of greater status, and I'm going to go and marry up and marry this guy, and it doesn't matter that what she's doing is wicked. She marries him. She doesn't like John preaching and, and cutting right to the heart and, and exposing her sin and exposing their wickedness and calling out that it's not right, it's not lawful for them to be doing this. So she's so mad at this, she, she gets Herod to arrest him and throw him into prison. Now, what was he doing? Nothing. Was he breaking any laws? No. But here he is, 
getting thrown in prison. Now, I, when I say was he breaking laws, no, I don't know all of the laws were at Rome in, in, you know, in the Roman Empire, so I'm not claiming to know that they didn't have a law against speaking against Herod or whatever. If they did, the Bible says that, the, and it, which is what really matters, that against such there is no law, that you know, when you're doing right, when you're doing good, when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're preaching the Word of God, there's no law against that. There's no valid law against that. There's no law of man that could supersede what God's word says anyways. If God's word says there's no law against it, against such things there is no law. John the Baptist was doing everything right, so uh, he was arrested and thrown in prison for no good reason, no lawful reason. Verse number five, let's keep reading here. The Bible says, And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So not only did his wife want John the Baptist thrown in prison, she wanted him dead. And he was willing to go through with it too. He's just like, well, I'll put him to death. But notice, he fears the multitude. He says, well, the people, they don't want this guy put to death because they think he's a prophet. And this is your typical politician, right? But this is actually how politicians are supposed to be handled and dealt with, notice that he feared the people. So he didn't do something wicked because he feared the people. You have a big problem, and I'm not going to get too political tonight, but just in general, you have a big problem in your country and in your nation when your leaders are putting the people into fear instead of them being in fear of the people. When they start getting all this power and just being able to do whatever to you, and the people are all fearful of, of what government's going to come and do to you, you're not in a very good, you know, that's a tyrannical situation. It, the roles need to be reversed where they ought to be fearing what, you know, and well, ultimately, the, the ideal situation is that the person in charge fears God. That's ideal. When you've got the ruler fearing God, then you're, then, then you're in a much, much better situation. The next best thing is fearing the people, right? And the worst case scenario is when all the people are just fearing this, this tyrant. And what we, see with, what we also see with Herod, though, besides just being a politician, he's just kind of swayed. He, he's a real weak, real weak person. He's got his wife telling him what to do, and he's just listening. Okay, yeah. get that guy arrested. I'm going to arrest it. Okay, get him put to death. Okay, yeah. oh, wait, no, I can't because these pe I fear these people more than I fear you. Right? He's more, he's more feared about the, the multitude of people than he is about his own wife. He's saying, so I'm, I'm going to listen to these, these people over here. We see another example as we keep reading when there's this birthday, and he's got other people around, and he, and he decides to end up beheading John because of these other people that are sitting with him. It's like, dude, just make up your mind and do what you do and do what's right because you think it's right. Don't just be swayed and be influenced by everybody else and just trying to do a, be a people pleaser and just do what everyone else wants you to do. Why don't you just do what's right? Decide what's right and do what's right. But Herod does, is, a, is a coward. He's not a man. He doesn't have the backbone to just stand and think for himself. He just wants to try to take the easy path of just trying to appease everybody trying to appease his wife. He couldn't fully appease his wife because he had to appease these people. And then while he's appeasing these people, well, now he's got these other people he needs to appease. So he's trying to do this balancing act of just trying to keep everybody happy instead of doing what's right. Let's see what happens here in verse number six. The Bible says, but when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now, I've heard a lot of preaching about this, and I'm sure the dance wasn't a very good dance. We don't know very many details about it, though. I mean, whatever, however she danced, whatever it was that she did, was enough to get Herod to basically promise her whatever she wanted. Now, I mean, it is what it is, and that's what it, that's what it says. I don't think we could just go too far overboard in depth onto what exactly that is. Regardless, though, as she dances before them and, and pleases Herod, it says in verse 7, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, so see, her mom's just plotting and planning this wicked person to get John put to death. So she's already planning with her daughter and, and already knew 
For, uh, somehow she knew that her daughter was going to probably get something from, from dad or from stepdad, right? Because she goes out and she's, okay, here's what I want you to do. You know, you're going to go out and dance and get him to, to, to give you whatever you ask for. And here's what you're going to ask for. You're going to ask for the head of John the Baptist because I want him dead. And she follows through with it. It says here, and she being instructed before, uh, being before instructed of her mother said, give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry. See, the king didn't want to do it. He's like, oh man, you know, why do you have to ask for that? I don't want to do that. He actually liked John. He liked hearing him when he was in prison. Now, obviously, he only liked him so much because he still kept him bound. He still kept him in prison falsely. And he still ended up putting him to death. But you can see here, like, he didn't want to do it. To the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake. And them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. So whether it's his wife, whether it's the people, whether it's his daughter, whether it's his other people, he's just being influenced by everyone else around him. Look, don't be Herod. Don't be like that. Learn to stand for what's right, regardless of who it's going to upset, regardless of who gets offended. No matter what the consequence is, you need to be able to stand up and do what's right and say, no, we're not going to behead John the Baptist because he didn't do anything worthy of death. If he said something that offends you, then that's too bad, wife. No, we're not going to behead John the Baptist. He's a man of God. We're not going to do that to someone unlawfully. Sorry, daughter. I liked your dance, but it wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, you need to be able to stand up for what's right. And if people get offended, if people lose respect for you, whatever. We're not to be people pleasers. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 10. The Bible says, And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. How wicked is that? And think about just how much power there is, too. Like, this, I just want, I want this guy dead, and it's just done. And they just bring out a head just on a silver platter. Here you go. Here's a head of a human being to just, just get away with that and do that. It's, it's disgusting. It's wicked. And, and this is... This is some of the spiritual wickedness in high places that the Bible talks about. It's people that hate God and are able to do these types of things and they plot and plan and they get away with it. But you know what? The Bible tells us that one day their time is going to come. So we don't have to let this, these types of things get us down and get discouraged. I mean, obviously it's not fun to have to, you know, for Jesus Christ even, he hears about John the Baptist, it was his friend, it was his cousin. Right? He, doesn't, he doesn't want to hear about, about these things happening to John the Baptist, but he knows how things are going to play out in the end. He knows that John the Baptist is going to be honored. He's going to see him again. And we don't need to get discouraged when wicked people do wicked things and they seem to not get caught. Because I guarantee you that this, that this wicked woman is burning in hell right now, and she's been burning in hell for a couple thousand years already. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. Now, I think Jesus left because things were getting kind of hot anyways. It wasn't his time to be arrested and, and to be put to death yet. And uh, he goes out, but he also just goes... And he's kind of going to be alone, right? Notice it says, when Jesus heard of it, so he hears about the death of John the Baptist in verse 13. He went by ship into a desert place, just apart. He's trying to just go and be alone, which is normal. Someone just, just finds out that their, you know, their, fan, their relative got beheaded. And it's like, man, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go be alone for a little while. But when the people hear that Jesus leaves, they follow him out of, uh, it says, on foot out of the city. So they're still just following after him. He's just going to try to get some peace, get some time alone. And this is what um, you know, we need to understand about, about someone who's a minister and someone who's a man of God. And especially the more work that people are doing, you, you, you know, Jesus came to minister unto people. Even when he tries to get some time to himself, 
he still ends up helping people. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. So he's going to try and be by himself, trying to get some alone time in a desert place. But all these people are following him. He looks at him. He sees this great multitude. He says, It was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. So even in his time of grieving and sorrow and, and going to just, just get a little bit of a break and to be away and to get alone and pray with God and, and to do stuff, he still just sees all these people and has compassion on them and heals them. Amen. He doesn't have a bad attitude. And says, get out of here. Don't you know what I just went through and dealt with? Didn't you hear the news? He still has compassion on people enough to, to, to help them, to heal them. Jesus Christ's job never ends. And if we're going to follow Jesus Christ, if we're going to try to, to be his disciple and walk in his steps and do as he would do, then we need to understand that as well. You know, the, that job never ends. The job of being a Christian, the job of following Christ, it's not an easy job. You might end up getting weary from time to time, but the Bible says not to get weary in well-doing. That we need to keep going. And we need to find that strength. And we need to go to God for strength to help us through these times, but not to lose that compassion that we have on people. Don't let this world and wicked people beat you down to lose the empathy and to lose the compassion on people that need help. Verse number 15, the Bible says, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals." So, it's getting late, you know, because he, he went out to a desert place, but all these people followed him out there. Now his disciples are saying, hey, you know, the day's kind of getting pretty far spent and all these people are out there. It's not like there's a store right over here and we could all go sit down in a restaurant. You know, they're out kind of in the middle of nowhere. And he's like, Let, let's wrap things up, call it a day and send them out so that they can go and get their food and we can go about our business and they could go take care of themselves. And when it says buy them vittles, it's what vittles are, it's their provision, it's their food, things like that. And um, Jesus answers them over 16, says, but Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. They don't need to go anywhere. Give ye them to eat. So why don't you give them some food? And they said unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, well, all we got are these five loaves of bread and a couple fish. Like I would, we've got multitudes here. And he said, bring them hither to me. He said, okay, bring it to me. Verse 19, and he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. So a great miracle, obviously a very well-known miracle in the Bible. Jesus feeds the 5,000 with, the, with the, um, the five loaves and the two fishes. There's so many lessons and so much to learn. We're gonna, I'm going to try to go through and cover some of the highlights just of this story and all the things that we could learn from this. But first of all, just painting the picture, when it says there was 5,000, it wasn't just the whole group was 5,000. It says there was 5,000 men. And in addition to the 5,000 men, there was also women and children. And it doesn't give us the numbers, but first of all, just, I mean, just 5,000 people alone is a, is a pretty large number to be able to feed everybody out in the middle of nowhere. On top of that, let's say you had one woman for every man that was there. Who knows, right? Who knows if there's more women, less women, whatever. Let's just say one and then one child because, you know, obviously some would probably have maybe multiple children, some would have none. I mean, you're talking 15,000 people. And no one knows the exact number. I don't know the exact number. I'm just, just trying, to, trying to be reasonable here with what we can consider how many people. That's a lot of people out in one place to be able to, one, just to manage, and, and two, to, to, to feed. This shows, uh, the reason why I'm kind of I'm bringing up and just, just imagine all these, these numbers, you know, 15,000 people, how much does a, like a, a stadium, a typical stadium hold? I know there's different sizes and stuff. Does anyone know like, uh, I'm sorry? 80, like 80 for the bigger ones, right? But like the, there's, there's smaller ones, probably around 50,000. 
I'm just trying to get a, a, a picture of like, like how many people is 15,000 people. It is a lot of people. And for Jesus to take, and that's why his, his disciples were like, we've got five loaves of bread. <laughs> you know, what, what do we want to do? We've got five loaves of bread. But they bring it to Jesus. And what does Jesus do with it? He blesses it. Bless the food. He breaks it. And then he gives it to the disciples. And then the disciples hand it out to the multitude. And there's so much symbolic and broken here. Of course, we know from Scripture, Jesus Christ is referred to as the bread of life. Jesus is the bread. We have the, the, the Last Supper, right, where he has communion with his disciples and he breaks the bread. It's no mistake here that he's breaking the bread before all and, and having that bread distributed for all to eat. And notice his body was broken for us. His broken body is sufficient for everybody. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, being broken is enough for everybody. Everybody. His one payment, what he did for us, is enough to cover all sin. It's enough for every single person. And the, the bread that was distributed was enough to feed everybody. In fact, everybody was full. Nobody was left going, well... You know, that was good, but I'm still lacking a little bit. There's still, I'm still kind of hungry. I didn't quite get enough to eat. Everybody was satisfied to the point to where there was leftovers. To the point to where there was more leftovers than what they started with. Nobody had lack. He gave to his disciples, notice that, and the disciples gave to the multitude. As a disciple of Jesus, we need to be freely passing out that bread of life to the multitude. They already received the bread from Jesus. Now they're taking that bread and they're distributing it to everybody else. Jesus wasn't directly going one-on-one -on -one with everybody in the group. He gave to his disciples. His disciples gave to the people. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, you need to be taking that bread of Christ and bringing it out to the multitude so that they could be filled so that they could eat of the bread and never be hungry again. The fact that there was leftovers, think about that. Twelve baskets full. What does that tell me? Well, that tells me that there was room for more people. More people could have been there. If more people had been there, they would have been satisfied too. Anybody that would have showed up, everybody that could have been there, they all would have had enough food. There is no shortage of what, of what Jesus' sacrifice and what the, the bread of life can offer for us. Had they showed up, there would have been enough for them. And the leftovers were more than what they started with. This highlights the miraculous provision of God and what He's able to do even with very little when you give all that you have. It doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter how much you have to start with. If you give what you have unto God, say, Here, here's what, all I got. Here it is, God. But I want to work for you. I want to help people. I want to be a minister. God can take whatever it is that you have and, and just vastly multiply that to the point to where there is no, there's no wanting. And this is a theme we've seen over and over again with miracles in the Bible. Think of Elijah, how he was being sustained, and he would go in and, and uh, help the lady with, the, with the, the, the meal and with the oil. And, you know, it's just like there's, there's always enough. God's always able to provide, and then he's able to provide even more. And just take and multiply whatever it is you have. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. Keep your place here in Matthew 14. We're going to flip back and forth a few more times throughout this passage to John 6, because John 6 parallels Matthew 14. And I like the way that, the, uh, that John records this story regarding the, uh, the, the five fish, or the, the five loaves and two fishes. Because the disciples had no idea how they could feed so many. Look at verse number 7 in John chapter 6. And just keep a bookmark in both places because we're coming back to John 6 a little bit later. 
John 6, verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. That's just demonstrating how many people are there. 200 penny worth, you say, well, 200 pennies is only two bucks. That's not a lot of money, right? Well, if you remember that a penny is, like a, is equivalent to a day's wage in the Bible, that's a lot of money. I mean, how much is a person making a day? A hundred bucks? I don't know. I mean, just whatever, right? A, a day laborer, you make a hundred bucks in a, in a day times 200. And he says, that's not even enough. That's just barely enough or not, not enough. It's not sufficient so that everyone could have a little bit. And that's how many people there are. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of money. And then it says in verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? He's like, this is just a drop in the bucket. What is that five loaves and two? There's a lad. There's just this boy here who's got these five loaves and two fishes. But what is that going to do among so many people? Don't ever take what God has given you for granted. Don't ever think, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. What, what is it that I can I don't have very many skills. I don't have those, any great speaking ability. I don't have this. I don't have that. Well, what do you have? All I have is, hey, what can God do with that? Amen. All I have is five loaves and two fishes. That's it. And look at all these people. Look at all this work there is to do. Look at all these people in need. Hey, give it to God. Amen. Let God multiply it. Let God do with you what he's going to do. Don't worry about the outcome. Just do what you can. Just give what you have. God will make sure that the rest gets taken care of. Use what you have and rely on God to give the increase. Let's go back to Matthew 14. Like I said, keep a place there in John 6. We're going right back there. John, or Ma excuse me, Matthew 14, verse number 22. Bible reads, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So now after this, this feeding of the 5,000, he's saying, okay, you guys, we're going over there. You get started without me. I'm going to send all the people away. Okay, and that's exactly what he does here. Verse number 23, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. So he finally does end up getting his alone time. But again, this just still shows you how much work and what Jesus did while he's on this earth and how he really didn't have much rest. I mean, he was, he tries to get alone. There's still people following him. So he's healing them. He's feeding them. Now, think about this too. Jesus Christ, yeah, he was God, but he was God in the flesh. He experienced and went through. He understands what it's like to be human because he, he limited himself in the sense that he took on this human body. And that's why we can go to him with boldness. He understands what we go through. He understands the, 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 the constraints in our bodies and, and, and all of the things that go along with that, the hunger, the tiredness, the sorrow, all the things that go along with being in his body. He understands that. Yet he still did all the work. And anyone who's ever gone out soul winning for any length of time you know, if you were just to take that, instead of going soul winning, if you walked the same distance that you walked when you go out soul winning, right? Let's say a whole day and just did a walk. Would you really be that exhausted or that tired at the end of the day? I would say probably not. I mean, I know for myself, just going through some doors, maybe walk up some stairs, go down some stairs. At the end of the day, you're not going to really feel that tired. I mean, it's, it's not that much strenuous work when it comes to soul winning and just walking around. What gets you tired when you're preaching the gospel to people? And anyone who goes out soul winning knows that this is true. It, it's, it's draining in a sense that like nothing else is. It's spiritually draining when you are going and giving the gospel and you're preaching and you're, you're trying to expound on the word of God and trying to reach people and get them saved. You know, you don't feel like you're lifting weights. You don't feel like you're getting out of breath or you're doing any physical exercise. But boy, at the end of the day, man, are you exhausted? You spend hours and hours out soul winning and not just knocking on doors, but I mean like talking to people. You're giving the gospel to people. You get tired. It is draining. Think about what Jesus is doing. 
How much more draining must it be to be healing people and just preaching for however long on end and, and then feeding people and just, just everything he's doing is just so spiritual and so good. Man, that's draining. And then after all that, he still goes up in the mountain and he still goes to pray. He says, nope, I still need time to pray. I still need time to talk to the Father. And he does all that. And then when he's done, he's done praying, it's the middle of the night, and he's going to catch back up with his disciples. When does this guy sleep? It's amazing. But what a, what a great example for us, too. I mean, it, he was constrained by a fleshly body. That is a good example for us. Even though we're not God, if he was able to do it, he was physically able to do it as a human being. There's a lot that we're able to do. And I think the vast majority of time, we fail to, to reach our potential. And I think we fall way short to meet our potential of what we can do in this life in our service to God. We need to learn to not be so spoiled. I don't know. What's the right word? To, to not be so uh, used to being comfortable. To, to not just, just, oh, I'm a little bit tired. Oh, we don't have time to read. Oh, I don't have time to pray. Oh, well, I mean, I got to get eight hours of sleep. I got to do this. I got to, you know. Look at what Jesus went through. To do all this stuff. And you know what? He survived. And he went through. And he did it. And he helped people. And he did amazing things. And, you know, be very careful not to think too highly of yourself either with the work that you're doing. Why don't you compare yourself to some of the people that we see in the scripture and be like, wow, am I really doing? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me? Look at how much that he's done. What a great song to get you just to think and get in the right attitude and the right mindset. Like, Man, I, there's always more we can do. There is always more that we can do. And don't, I'm not saying this to discourage you. I'm saying this to motivate you. Think about what else can you do. How else can I, can I increase and do more for the service of the Lord? Whatever area that might be in. How, how can I do more? I know I can do more. When you're weary, when, when things are hard, look, we can do more. We just need to keep pushing ourselves a little bit more. So he sends the multitudes away. Uh, he went up in a mountain to pray. When the evening was come, he was there alone. Verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea. So by the time he sent everyone away, he goes up in a mountain. The ship that he sent his disciples off in, they're right in the middle of the sea. And it says it's tossed with waves for the wind was contrary. So the wind had come. There's kind of a storm moving in. And there's just all kinds of waves in the middle of the sea. And they're right smack dab in the middle of the sea when all this is going on. Verse 25 says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now, the fourth watch of the night, this is the middle of the night. Because you got the night and day are split up into 12 hour time frames, right? You got 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night, roughly. And when you have four watches, there's four watches in a night. So four divided by 12 is three hours, right? Night's going to start at sunset. Day's going to start at sunrise. Makes sense. So you've got the first watch is going to be from 6 to 9. Second watch from 9 to 12. Third watch from 12 to 3. Fourth watch from 3 to 6. So this is like 3 o'clock in the morning. Fourth watch of the night. He's walking on the water, going out to, to his disciples on the boat. And he was going to walk right past them, too, the Bible says. I, I don't think it's in this account. I think it's another one. He's just like, he's just like ready to go on. And they see him out there, and they, and they think it's a spirit, right? Because, I mean, what? you don't normally see people walking on the water, so they're just like, well, what's that? The only thing that could do something like that would be a spirit. But no, it was Jesus Christ, right? And um, it says here, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now, what's just really amazing about this, I think, is really cool, uh, 
is how this represents as a picture of the tribulation and the rapture. And I'm not going to get into too much detail tonight, but um, we are going to look back at John chapter 6 also. But in Matthew 14, so he said it's, a, it's the, the boats in the middle of the sea. There's all kinds of waves going on. There's all kinds of turmoil and trouble. And then it's the fourth watch of the night. Jesus comes unto them walking on the sea. And then in verse 32, the Bible says, And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. So the storm stops. Everything's fine. As soon as Jesus comes on board the ship, everything's good. Flip back over to John chapter 6. We're going to look at verse number 19. Verse number 19 says, So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. So here it gives us a little bit different information. Uh, we know that they're in the midst of the sea, so they're roughly in the middle of the sea. They're, they're halfway between where they started and where they're ending. And they've gone approximately 25 or 30 furlongs. Now, a furlong is an eighth of a mile. And because they've gone either 25 or 30, it's, there's obviously an estimate here. It's not an exact number. 25 furlongs would be uh, like three and an eighth miles in to three and, a, three, and three quarters Miles. So anywhere between three and an eighth to three and three quarter miles in because the whole sea is about seven miles across. And especially when you, you know, that's the way it measures even today. And when you do it just based on the furlongs as well, you're going to come up with that same answer. So think about this. They're three, they're approximately three and a half miles in. They're halfway there. You know, what do we know from Revelation? What do we know from other parts of the Bible about when the rapture is going to take place and the Great Tribulation? It happens about midway through that seven-year period of, uh, that, that's commonly known as Daniel's 70th week, right? That time frame that uh, the Antichrist comes into power and then starts bringing tribulation against the saints. He's reigning for about three, three and a half years before Jesus Christ comes back, and then um, God pours out his wrath, of course, and then at the end of that, that full seven-year term, Jesus Christ sets up his millennial kingdom. So I, just th I think this is really cool. They get about three and a half miles in, right, roughly. Now, no one knows the day or the hour, and we know it's right around that three and a half year mark, which falls in perfectly with this story here. And then it says in John 6, look at verse number 21. And this is really, really interesting. And you can't overlook this. This, this wasn't information that's recorded in Matthew 14. Because in Matthew 14, it says, when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And then it's like, well, and when they got to the other side, this and this happened. Nothing too notable in Matthew about that. But look at verse 21 in John 6. It says, then they willingly received him into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the land, whither they went. That's a miracle right there. They were halfway through the sea. As soon as he gets into the boat, it's like, boom, we're here. Just straight from being in the middle to just being on shore. And that's the way it's going to be. Instead of going through this whole time frame as a believer, when Jesus comes, it's just, we're just warped out and we don't have to travel the rest of of the way through that storm, through all the difficulty that's to come, right? And just in Matthew, it says, you know, the wind ceased. So everything stopped. All the trouble stopped. And, and obviously in, in Scripture, too, you're going to see storms and tempests are also very symbolic of just rough times in your life, storms in your life, bad things are happening. And this was a great storm basically in the in the midst of the sea with these waves going up all around them and stuff troublous times that's that's symbolic of the tribulation so i think that's pretty cool and it says um also you know the fact that immediately the ship was at the land the bible says except those days should be shortened there should no flesh be saved of course in in matthew 24 right it's talking about that there's going to be so much great tribulation 
that no flesh is going to be saved because the, the, the Antichrist could be going after them. People are going to be martyred, put to death. There's going to be so much great tribulation that none of them would make it, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And this is a picture of that shortening, right, of that time to, to get through. It's just, boom, done, immediately at hand. The other thing that's cool, too, is, you know, the, the, it talks about being in the fourth watch of the night. Well, the Bible tells us to watch, right, that we're not supposed to be uh, asleep as others are. We're children of the day. And, and that we need to watch. And if, you know, if the, the good men had known what hour his house would be broken into, he'd be watching. And Jesus comes to them in the fourth watch. It was a time of darkness. It's a time where generally people all around, they're going to be sleeping or they're going to be involved in wickedness or whatever, but they're supposed to be up and watching. And they are when he comes back. And, that's, and that's, they see him, right? He, he was ready to just walk right on past them. They were, they were ready to be left behind, but they were watching. So, uh, anyway, I, I think that's really cool. Obviously, you know, this isn't what you turn to to try to prove someone a, a post-trib, pre-wrath rapture. Uh, this is just a really cool little icing to the cake of, of what's known as the, 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 you know, the doctrine that we believe in, the, the post-trib rap, uh, rapture. But it's neat the way that these things play out and you kind of look deeper into the scripture and, and just find more and more meaning in some of these stories that... Because, I mean, when you, when you read it, you've got to think, like, well, that's kind of odd. How was that? Why is the ship just immediately there? And, and you start looking at some of these details. You know, something should be standing out right away. Even if you don't figure out exactly what it is, you're like, you know, this isn't in there by accident. It's not like that's just some random detail that doesn't really mean anything, but it's just in the Bible. No, everything has a meaning in the Scripture. And, and that's kind of a big one there to... to pick up on what this is teaching and, and what, the, what the greater lesson is in the middle of everything else that's going on. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 14, because in between this time, now obviously they see Jesus walking on the water, and I kind of covered just the symbolic meaning of that, but before Jesus enters the boat, Peter goes out and walks on water with him. And this is a really cool story. This is something, you know, I love this story because this is extremely motivating. You think about the cool things that you can do. I mean, this is a story for Peter, the Apostle Peter, that he probably told until, until the day that he died. I mean, wouldn't you? The day that you walked on water? How cool is that? that and, you know, that shows the excitement that the Christian life can really have. I mean, it's not some boring, dull life that we live or have to live. There's all kinds of exciting things you can do when you set your eyes on Jesus. Look at verse number 26. The Bible says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou... Bid me come unto thee on the water. So if it's really you, why don't you tell me to come out there with you? Right? I wonder if he knew what he was saying when those words are coming out of his mouth. But he's saying, if it's really you, you know, cause what, if, what if it was really a, a devil spirit or something? He's like, yeah, come on out here, right? <laughs> but this is what he says. He says, hey, if it's really you, bid me come out. And he says, come. Come on. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's great. That's, that, man, how exciting is that? But think about what it must be like, the trepidation, the anxiety, the fear, as you're getting out of a boat. Now, they're in the middle of the storm. There's still the waves are going on. And he's like, hey, if it's really you, call me out there. So, okay, so now he just called his bluff. He said, okay, come on out. So he's getting over the side of the boat. And that first step, it's like, and what would that feel like? I don't wonder. I, I don't think about these things. Maybe it's kind of weird, but it's like, is it, does he feel like he's walking on this, this solid? So he must be. I don't know. Real interesting. But um, he says, come. Peter climbs over the side of the boat and starts walking towards him. And uh, 
has this awesome event happen, we need to get out of our boat. Because what's a boat represent? A boat represents safety, security, right? I mean, it's, that's what you go, they're, they're going through the midst of a storm, but hey, at least they're in a boat. They've got something to help protect them. It's, it's a lot of turmoil outside of the boat. But you know when, when the great things happen, it's when you, when you have the courage and the boldness to get out of that boat sometimes and to, and to get in the midst of the storm. Do something a little uncomfortable. Don't just stay wrapped up tight like Jonah sleeping in the bottom of the boat when the storm's going on. Look, get up, go out, do something. Get, get in, get out of the boat. Live by faith. And, look, and what does Peter do? He looks to Jesus, right? He sees him out there. He's looking right at Jesus. He asks Jesus, can I come unto you? you know, bid me to come unto you. If it's you, to... he talks to him, he asks him, he hears him, and then he goes to him. He goes straight towards him. Eyes on Jesus the whole time. He doesn't get in any trouble until he takes his eyes off Jesus. As long as his eyes are on Jesus, he's, he's focused on him. He's out of that boat. He's in the middle of all these troubles. He's, he's forsaken the safety of his boat. He's going straight out, but he's going straight towards the Savior. Walking straight out. He should have no reason to fear, no problems at all. But what happens is, of course, because he's human, he, it says here in verse 30, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and being to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. So he got fearful. Why? Because he saw the wind. Because he saw, oh man, there's this wave coming up here. You know, all of a sudden, he starts to kind of look around him and see what's going on instead of just staying focused on Jesus. We need to remain focused on the heavenly things, on the spiritual things. Because when you take your mind off of that and you start looking around and you start looking too closely at all the storm and all the other things and all the perilous times and everything else that might be going on around you, you can get scared. It could cause you to even have a lapse of faith. It could cause you to start to sink. Peter started to sink. But you know what he did? He put his eyes right back up on Jesus. He said, Lord, save me. And I love this part too. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand. He's right there for him. God, God's not going to let you down. Now, we may let him down, but he's not going to let you down. He took his eyes off him for a very short period of time. He started to get fearful. He started to sink. But then he's like, Lord, save me. You come right back. Let this story encourage you. Keep your mind on the heavenly things because you can do great things through the power of God. Through, it wasn't Peter's own power of his own miracle allowing him to walk on that water. God let him do that. As long as he had his eyes focused on the right place, he did all kinds of amazing things. He was willing, first of all, just to yield himself up and say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Hey, call me out there and I'll go to you. He gets out of the boat. He gets in the middle of all this stuff. But when his eyes are on Jesus, everything's great. His eyes slip a little bit, but you know what? Set him right back forward again and you can keep on going. and Keep on moving. You don't have to worry because, because God is there for you. Verse 31, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? He's saying, why did you doubt? Everything was going great. And you know what? We should look at ourselves as, you know, because to me, it's just kind of, he's kind of like, how silly, right? Why would you doubt? We need to, to tell that to ourselves sometimes. You start doubting this Christian life, this doubting, this separated life, doubting, you know, putting in all this time and energy and effort into, into doing all this church stuff. Right? We could be going out and doing something else and having fun. You know, I think this is fun. I don't know. I love, I love being part of this church, and the more time I invest, the more I love it. And that's just, I'm, that's just me speaking from my heart. I'm not trying to sound like extra spiritual or anything. Like, I love this church, and I love what God's doing here, and I hope that you do too. And, you know, when, when things start to just feel like they're, they're bringing you down, 
get, get your mind back. Get your eyes focused back on Jesus and set on, on, on the right things. We can have a lot of fun doing this. We have all kinds of fun in the midst of a storm. I think about yourself as like little kids. I know my kids, when the storm out, they love to go outside, play in the rain and everything else. Let's be like those types of kids. Hey, in the middle of the storm, let's just go and do, you know, in the midst of the storm, obviously doing what's right, but we could have fun doing it. Peter got out of the boat. That must have been great. How fun would that be? Verse 32, And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And you wonder, like, I mean, his disciples were in that, in that ship. I wonder how many times they had that thought going through their mind or even said that to Jesus. Of, I mean, it's just, it's proven to them, I think, over and over and over. Because, mind you, we're in Matthew 14. He's already done all kinds of miracles and healing people and stuff. They've already known he was a son of God. But it's just, it's just kind of like, it seems like their mind just keeps getting blown by all these things that Jesus is able to do. I mean, so he's out there walking on the water. The wind stops. They're right at the shore. It's like, you're son of God. There's no other explanation. You are the son of God. Verse 34, And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. His job still isn't over. What a day. What a night. I mean, all this, look at what Jesus is doing. I mean, how many sleepless nights has, that, has, has Jesus Christ had for the people, for us, for everybody? Don't get, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Don't, don't, don't be a baby, right? Don't go soft. Men, women, boys, girls, don't go soft. You might need to stay up a little extra late studying the Word, preparing yourself. You might need to get up a little extra early, getting to church, making sure everything's ready, making sure your life's in order, your family's in order. You might need to do a little extra work. You just might need to do it. But don't, don't just go soft. And just quit and back up and say, oh, I can't do this anymore. Look at what Jesus did for you. We see the Apostle Paul giving the same type of, you know, he's being an example of people. I could have taken money from you. You know, it would be totally right for me. But you know what I did? I stayed up late. I worked with my hands. I worked willingly. And I didn't take anything from you guys because I want to show you that you can work a full-time job and you can work in a ministry and you can serve the Lord and you can do all of these things and you just have to work hard and do it. And don't tell yourself you can't do it. Don't let yourself just fall into this lazy mentality. Oh, I hurt. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I can't do this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. What a great, you know, we're going to continue to read through this. But I often just wonder. It still, it still blows me away when you see people. It's like. They do so much. And instead of, don't get discouraged by that. Really don't. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to, to cause anybody here to be like, oh man, I'm such a terrible person. Be encouraged just to do more and then to find strength through other people. Find the strength through God, through Jesus, through all this stuff. And make the decision that it's important you to do so. What's a little bit of extra sleep? What's a little bit of, of giving up a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of, of playtime to get some really important things done? I, you, know, you know who it meant a lot to that Jesus didn't get a lot of sleep? It meant a lot to all those people that got healed. Think about them. When you think about all the things that you want to do, 
Think about the time that you could be spending for others and how much value they can get out of it versus whatever value you're getting out of not doing, you know, sitting around. Sitting around on your rear end doing nothing. Everybody's guilty of that from time to time. I, I'll be the first one to raise my hand, but let's not just be complacent. Let's not just be okay with that. Let's move forward. Let's keep pushing ourselves. That's why we're here. Let's provoke one another in the love and good works. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for uh, these great, exciting stories that we have in the scripture. And, and Lord, we know that, that you can do just as many miracles today as you've ever been able to do. There's nothing restraining you or holding you back, Lord. Um, we're the ones that end up restraining you with our lack of faith. But God, we want to do more. We want your great power to be known. We pray that you would please just help us and use us to, to, to do that, to further that end, that um, we could just, just bring honor and glory unto your name and that we can just bring people under the knowledge of Christ and, and lead people there, Lord. Help us to, to do great and, and many and wonderful works uh, in your name. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.